Welcome. Wow, that's a lot of baggage. Are you checking in all of that baggage with us today? Yeah. You would like it to fly with you to each and every single destination? Yeah, that's uh, bringing it with me. I'm going to need you to weigh all of that baggage on the scale here, please, for us. There we go. Your baggage is heavy. Oh. Wow, it appears even your baggage has its own baggage. So in our tier system for baggage pricing, yours is marked as excessive, which means that your checked-in baggage comes to a total of $150 in the addition to the $25 travel fee, and the carry-on that you're taking will be an additional $75, not to mention the overages, bringing your grand total to $525.78 with us. How will you be paying? Uh, debit, I guess. Okay. Sure. Is there anything else we can do today to make your experience more accommodating or comfortable for you and or all of your baggage? No, no, uh, no. Just please take my baggage. Welcome, welcome. It's good to be back. Who has ever had jet lag? Raise your hand if you had jet lag. Isn't that amazing? Like, you're not a believer until you're a believer, amen? Like, till it's like 3.30 and you fell asleep Grocery shopping, that's jet lag. That's like real jet lag. Jet lag is real. And here's the reality. Here's the result of jet lag. God did not design our bodies. Look, airplanes are great. Praise God for engineers. God did not design our bodies to literally fly multiple time zones and try to figure it out. Like our bodies don't know where we are. They don't know what we're doing. Our body can't figure out daylight, darkness. We're like, we're a total, absolute mess. But let me tell you something. This is our culture. You may have never been on an airplane in your life, but you've experienced jet lag. Our culture moves at a pace that we cannot keep up with. We are literally moving so fast. We're hurting, we're not sleeping, we're not resting. Literally National Geographic last month came out with an article that said 100 years ago in America, people worked longer but slept better. 100 years ago, they worked longer, they slept better, they had less stress. Less stress, think about it. You, you go on vacation and you travel 17 hours, you're like, oh my gosh, this was so stressful. 100 years ago, you traveled when you started and when you ended, you have a different wife and lost a kid. That's the way it was like 100 years ago. Like, yeah, well, we were married, but I, we, you know, her husband died, so we, you know, we met in Denver and now we're, you know, I mean, like, can you imagine? Yeah, I flew from here to Beijing, but I met this gal, my wife died at hour 15 and then our kid, you know, I mean, it, but 100 years ago, people were less stressed because they were more rested, more rested. Some of you are not old enough to remember this, but there was a time when the TV shut off at midnight, it went <laughs> and you're like, I gotta go to sleep because there's nothing worthless to watch for the rest of the evening. But now there's endless media, endless media that literally you can consume and consume and consume, right? Or we stay up all night looking at people, oh, I hate her, I hate him, I hate her, I hate him. Oh, there's a party I wasn't invited to. Oh, there's something I'll never have. I hate her. She's beautiful. Ba -ba -ba. You know, all right? We just constantly are up and we're all upset. And then we play mindless games. Have you ever seen that? You're just watching people playing these games. Oh my gosh, I'm going to win a cherry. This is great. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have time for you. I've got to win this watermelon. But what is this? Right? That's our world. We can't stop. We don't know how to turn it off. And we wonder why our baggage is under our eyes. You ever had somebody say this to you? Wow, you don't look good. <laughs> and it's hurtful, but at least somebody says something, right? At least somebody says something. There was like a month last year where I had people say, are you okay? Are you okay? What's going on? Nothing, it's my face. God made it this way. Well, it wasn't my face, it's that I wasn't sleeping. So we're gonna look today at the baggage that's under our eyes because we have not listened to God. Listen to me, whether you've been a Christian your whole life or it's your first time in church, you're going to hear information today that literally your life depends upon. We're not even talking about eternal life. We're talking about this physical life. If you don't get this principle of rest, you're sinning against your body and you're wrecking your life. Let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we pray in the name of Jesus that your spirit would speak powerfully to us today. God, myself included, help us to understand why we need to rest. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at one of my favorite stories. If you want to open your Bibles to 1 Kings, we're going to be in chapter 19. I want you to write in your notes. This guy's name is Elijah, and he's one of the most powerful men, person to ever follow God. 
Just write in your notes, I'm not as good as him. I'm not as strong as him. I will never do the things that he did. This is one of the most incredible people who ever lived, right? When we go to heaven, he's going to be in the eternal hall of fame, right? That's who this guy is. You're not this guy. And this guy burns out. And this is what I want you to know. If all stars for God can burn out, what does that mean about you? What does that mean about you? What does that mean about me? So let me just kind of set the story. Ahab has one of the greatest battles and throwdowns between God and false gods in the history of the world. You see, literally Elijah is a prophet to the people of Israel. Israel's supposed to believe in God. For so, those of you who don't know, people literally, every time we go to Israel, we go to a trip, people always ask me this. How can these guides who teach us so much about Jesus miss Jesus? Listen to me, here's the story of Israel. They almost always got it wrong. Just like you and I almost always get it wrong. And so here's the people of God in the country of God who will not listen to the prophet of God. And so this is what Elijah says. Listen, we're having a drought, right? We're in California, maybe we need to pay attention. It hadn't rained, it hadn't rained. There's a problem, man. Literally, Israel is facing all kinds of consequences. All kinds of things are happening to the nation. And and, and Elijah says this to a guy named Obadiah, you tell the king to meet me at Mount Carmel and you tell him to bring all of the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. And some of you have no idea what that is. The prophets of Baal, the prophet of Asherah, it's the worship of sex gods, the worship of fertility. That's what the nation of Israel was worshiping. They were worshiping sex, sound familiar? Nobody's laughing. Apparently, you don't know where you live. They're worshiping sex, and Abraham says, you gotta choose between your sexual desires and God's desires for your life. You gotta make a choice, and he calls him to Mount Carmel. And so he says, prophets of Baal, you go first. You call out to your God, and here's the contest. We're going to call on the one true God to bring fire down from heaven and to literally just torch the altar. Torch the altar, you guys go first. And so he lets the prophets of Baal go first. They go all day long, they cry, they weep, they moan. They start cutting themselves because that's what the ancient prophets used to do. They cut themselves, they believed the blood that would flow literally off their body would hit the earth and awaken the God of spring, the God of fertility. So they're cutting themselves, they're moaning. And, and, and literally Elijah starts mocking them. Well, where's your God? Is your, is your God hard of hearing? Maybe he can't hear you. Literally, this is what it says in the Hebrew. Your English Bibles don't get it right. He says, maybe he's pooping. (laughs) Maybe he's gone to the restroom and he cannot be disturbed. Why don't you call louder? Why don't you call more? And they literally exhaust themselves all day long, all day. And then it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah says, I want you guys to bring 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. They build the stones. And then he says, I want you to cut the animal ready for sacrifice and place it on the wood and then I want you to douse it over and over and over again with water. There's so much water on it, literally it fills a trench surrounding and then he says to God, I want the nation of Israel to know who you are today. And Fire comes down from heaven and it burns the meat, the wood and the stone. Whoo, how many of you are getting your life right with Jesus at that moment? Yep, yep, always knew, I was on your team. I was on your, you're taking off your old jersey. Oh yeah, okay, I'm on your team, Jesus. And all of a sudden, man, this is what, this is what Elijah says to Ahab. He says, now I'm gonna call upon the Lord for it to rain. It hasn't rained in three and a half years. And I want you to know that God is a God who cares for people, who loves his people. And he prays seven times, seven times, God, make it rain. Seven times, God, make it rain. Second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, seventh time. Finally, there's a little tiny cloud in the sky. And Elijah says, the Lord is going to drench us. And he tells the king, you better get home. You better get home before this storm keeps your chariot from being able to move. And this is what the Bible says. Elijah prepared himself and he ran to Jezreel. Now, some of you never been to Israel. You don't know how far it is from Mount Carmel to Jezreel. Depending upon the trail that he took, it's somewhere between 17 miles and 30 miles. How many of you will never run that far in your life? Raise your hands. Raise your hands, right? You're not a marathon runner. That's not me. That's long distance running. Somewhere between 17 and 30 miles. That's how far he runs after he battles the prophets of Baal all day. He runs, and so this is where the story picks up. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel, that's his wife who doesn't believe in God, who hates God, everything Elijah has done, right? We're assuming there's gonna be a revival. Everybody's gonna be excited because God moved, including the way that he killed all the prophets. I forgot to include that. It was kind of crazy, but 
They slaughtered all of the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. She said, may the God strike me and even kill me by this tomorrow if I have not killed you just as you killed them. Some of you are like, that's my mother-in-law, Jezebel. <laughs> Underline these words. Elijah was afraid and he what? He fled for his life. Whoa, 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 whoa. You just brought down fire from heaven. You just torched an altar. You just shook a nation. You just slaughtered 450 prophets. What's the difference? Many of you miss it in the scriptures. He just ran 17 to 30 miles. He's been up all day. Write this in your notes. He's exhausted. How many of you are a different person when you're well-rested? Yeah. I don't even believe in Jesus until I've had coffee in the morning. <laughs> right? It's coffee, then Christ. Anybody with me? Who, who only reads their Bible as they're drinking coffee? It's just, that's me. That's me. Right? Coffee, it's a C, stands for Christ. I'm a Christian. Put them together. Boom. Powerful moment. <laughs> How many of you are a different person to your spouse when you're rested versus when you're tired? Anybody have a toddler? Ooh. Aren't they fun when they're tired? Does anyone want to see the devil? Johnny hasn't had a nap. <laughs> Isn't that crazy what can happen to a kid? Right? They're like, God is great. I love everyone. Ah! What happened? Nap, nap. Many of us missed it in this story. He just, he's tired. He's exhausted. He just faced 450 men who want to kill him, a king who wants him dead. And some woman says, I hate you. I'm going to kill you, right? She puts it out on Twitter. He's like, ah, what happened? He's tired. He was afraid and he fled, fled for his life. He went to Beersheba to a town in Judah. He left his servant there. He's running away from God. He's running away from the ministry. He went down and he sat alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might what? Die. You just won the Jesus Super Bowl. Now you want to die? He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who've already died. And then he laid down and he slept under a broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones with a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he what? He lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him again and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. And so he got up and he ate and he drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, underline this, the mountain of God. And there he came to a cave where he spent the night. Let me just ask you this question. What if you burn out in life and you miss out on the mountain of God? Some of you today, you don't need to hear from Jesus. You know what you need? A muffin and a nap. That's what you need. Listen to me, has anyone noticed we are basic people? It's not hard to figure out. Literally, take a nap, otherwise you're a cranky two-year-old. You need one, right? Why, why do you think your teenagers are so bad? Because they don't believe in naps anymore. Wouldn't that be awesome? Teenagers, nap. But I don't need it. Yes, you do. We need you to nap. <laughs> when I was a kid, I grew up in church. Every Sunday after church, my parents would go and take a nap and they would make us take a nap. And I would just sit in there. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> I would just sit in there. And I'm like, my parents are crazy. I don't understand. I'm 15 years old. I don't need a nap. My parents needed a break from me. <laughs> you go. Have a muffin, take a nap. <laughs> Write this down. My need for rest is real. It's real. 
Some of us, we get this twisted. We get it twisted, we get it wrong. Jesus has to set us straight. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people, not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So what do we do, church? Instead of resting, we fight over when we should rest. Can you do me a favor? Just take a nap and shut up. <laughs> Listen, the purpose of the Sabbath is not to meet some religious requirements so you can go check. The purpose is for you. God knows what you need, so he created it. And he, he knows this is what you need. Listen, I, I, I researched some medical journals and, and literally there are volumes that are being written. Listen to me, you could go to the doctor's list, less if you rest more. The whole medical community is figuring this out. And just so you know, the medical community is like the worst example ever of rest, right? All the nurses, amen, you know the schedules you work. No wonder we're not getting good advice. They haven't slept either, right? When I don't rest enough, do you know the number one thing that happens to us? We get sick. <sighs> There's a great book out. It's called The Body Keeps Score. Your body's like, we didn't rest, we didn't rest, we didn't rest. You're gonna rest. And it lays you down. You get sick. The less you sleep, the more you get sick. Productivity lacks. It's a reality. Well, I believe in the Lord. Yeah, you're gonna get sick, knucklehead. <laughs> you know the next thing that happens when you don't sleep? You can't think. What if that's why everyone got so stupid all of a sudden? Has anyone noticed that? <laughs> How many of you have ever said this? What are they thinking? They can't think. You're stupid. When you don't sleep, has anybody ever been there? You just can't, I, I, I like one time my wife's trying to, she's trying to have a conversation. I'm like, everything you're saying matters, I, I think. <laughs> right, I think I love you. I think I wanna stay married, but let's talk about it after I sleep. Has anybody ever been there where you literally can't concentrate? You're just like, yeah. <laughs> Google this. It is socially acceptable today in Japan to fall asleep in McDonald's. Google it. It's bizarre. I want to go to Japan just to see it. I'm going to take selfies with sleeping Japanese people. <laughs> There's an epidemic in Japan. Young people are not sleeping and they collapse. You know what that means? I could rob you. I'm not because I'm a Christian, but I could rob you. What are you going to do about it? You can't think, okay? Next, it lowers your sex drive. Some of you are like, well, I'm gonna make sure my husband stays up. <laughs> this, is how, this is how you know you're old, right? This is one of the signs. You're like, sex or the pillow? <laughs> right, anybody been there? Oh my gosh, I just need a nap. And all you young people, that will never happen. It will happen. It happens. I just really love my, my, my husband. Yeah, you wait till you have like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine kids. Man, you're gonna hit that bedroom. To... <laughs> it's true, man. We have some missionaries staying with us and they got four kids and a couple of them under five. Last night I was talking to the husband. I was like, hey, you wanna? And he's like, no. I was just laughing at him. I was like, yeah, I used to be there. <laughs> Next, you gain weight. Maybe that's why we're all so full. Isn't that crazy? Not sleeping makes you gain weight. This is from a medical journal. Oh. Next, write this to accident prone. You know, we went to Israel. My mom broke her ankle, my aunt twisted her ankle, and my daughter fell on her face. It's like day three. I'm like, the Browns are dying. <laughs> and I didn't handle it well because I hadn't slept either. I literally yelled at my daughter when she fell. And every, I know, in front of like 100 church people, everyone's like, oh, <gasps> Pastor Matt needs Jesus. Lastly, you look worse. Some of you cannot afford <laughs> to look any worse. 
Like, we got to work with what we got. Somebody says, you're going to sleep. Look at this. I need every hour. You're not going to believe me. And I don't even know if this is true because I wasn't around 100 years ago. But this is what National Geographic says. 100 years ago, Americans slept nine hours a night. Some of you have never done that in your life. That's why President Trump's tweets, 3 a.m., they're weird. <laughs> Go to sleep, Mr. President. Go to sleep. You can tweet in the morning. I mean, even if you're a Republican, you want that guy to nap. Come on. We all need it. We all need it. Next, rest is a command from God. Look, if you're not a Christian, do what you want. If you're a Christian, you don't get to do what you want. You're called to rest. It's a command from God. It's not a pray about it. It's not the 10 think about it. Right? Well, it's not like it's written in stone. Yes, it is. It is. It's in stone. Right? Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. As the Lord your God commanded you. It doesn't say pray about it. You have six days a week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. Some of you didn't even notice this. There's this fight going between Democrats and the president and the Democrats demanded, they demanded that the president respond to them. And some of you don't know this, but they were saying the president, this is what Mrs. Pelosi said, Senator Pelosi, she, or Congressman Pelosi, she said the president has 10 days to respond to us. If you've read the Constitution, it's not actually 10 days, it's 11 days. Do you know why? In our Constitution, it says the president is not mandated to count Sundays. Our founding fathers knew that even the most important job on earth needs a day off. Did you know that? It, the Sabbath day, which for early Christians in America was considered Sunday, that day's off. That day does not count because it's not the president's day, it's the Lord's day. Right, and everybody thinks we're getting smarter. The Sabbath day is a day of rest dedicated to the Lord, your God. On that day, no one in your house may do any work. Some of you don't need more chores for the kids. You need a smaller house. Always cracks me up, church people. My dream is to own property. Why? Why? It's horrible. This includes you, frontsiders. Preach this to your parents, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants. Now, a lot of you probably don't have those because <laughs> you live in the Inland Empire. Maybe this is epical to Newport Beach, but, you know, even your male servants need a day off. My friend and I were talking this week just as husbands, husbands, this is just between us. Can you imagine telling your wife this? Hey, honey, I'm going out with the guys. I left you a little list <laughs> of things to do while I'm gone. <laughs> you know what would happen? I'm not going anywhere with the guys. We're having a fight. But every time my wife leaves, there's a list. Hey, honey, while I'm out Sabbathing, I've come up with 10,000 things you need to do. Right? This includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male, your female servants. Even your husband needs a break. Even your oxen and your donkeys, that includes dumb husbands, need a break. And your livestock and foreigners living among you. All male and female servants must rest as you do. I was complaining when we were in Israel. And here was the thing. I was complaining to the tour guide. I said, why are we not flying El Al? El Al has a flight directly from Tel Aviv 
to Los Angeles. That way there's no stops and our church isn't dead when we arrive. And here's what the travel agent said. He said, we don't fly them because you're going home on Fridays. And El Al, for those of you who don't know Hebrew, means God's airline. They don't fly on Fridays. Can you imagine a major airline in the world not flying from Israel every Friday night from sundown to sundown on Saturday? El Al works six days a week and one day they stop. Let me just ask you, if you're an airline pilot, where do you wanna work? Every single week you know you have a day with your family. The pilot, the ground crew, the stewardesses, the people that put food on the plane, everything stops. Six days you shall work, and one day God says is for me. And isn't it incredible the one day God asks for himself is actually for your benefit? For those of you who don't know God, this is why you get to know him, because the commandments really have very little to do with him and everything to do with you. God loves you. He says, remember, circle that word, remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and his powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. Do you know what Pharaoh did to the slaves? He made them work harder and longer. And you know what? You don't get straw in your bricks. Listen to me, some of you call yourselves Christians, but you're still a slave to Pharaoh. Show me the verse in the Bible that says, work yourself to death. Some of you worship Pharaoh. You worship the wealth and gold of Pharaoh, and you are traveling all over the world to make money you don't need, to buy stuff you don't really want, to impress people you don't even like. But you will not submit to God, you worship Pharaoh. God says, you're not like that anymore. You don't live there anymore. Let me tell you something. America is Egypt, the literally wealthiest nation on earth. We're not called to the American dream. We're called to an eternal dream. We're called to something different. And let me tell you, look at our culture. We're stressed out. We're not resting. And we're dying of all kinds of freakish diseases because nobody's sleeping. Nobody's resting. Nobody's honoring God. And when you dishonor God, you dishonor yourself. Think about it, man. You know the beauty of being poor? Here's the beauty. All you want's a day off. You ain't going anywhere. You don't have any money. You just want a day off. When you're poor, you know what you get to do on your day off? Nothing, and it's godly. Then you get a little money. I'm gonna get a tent. I'm gonna go back in time, right? Everybody loves the, out I love the outdoors. It's so great, really? Then why are all the bugs trying to get in my house? They don't like it out there, they like it in. It drives me crazy. I'm gonna get a tent, right? Then you get a tent. Most of your hobbies aren't hobbies, you know what they are? They're part-time jobs where you don't get paid. I bought a boat, what are you doing on your day? I'm gonna wash this boat. I'm gonna wash this boat, I'm gonna wash this RV, I'm gonna fall off this RV, I'm gonna break my leg, right? I'm gonna do all this stuff. My wife and I, we were in Idaho visiting our sister. My wife says, we just, we just need a cabin up here. And I'm like, no, no. Do you know who in our family takes care of things when things break? Me. That's why my wife is like, you know what, we need more responsibility. I'm like, no. There's this beautiful thing called Airbnb. It's someone else's problem. We fly in, we fly out. It's not our issue. Right? Stop worshiping Pharaoh and start worshiping God. And here's the thing, the more money you get, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the further you have to go to feel like you've rested. I don't think that landed where it was supposed to. The more money you get, the further you've got to go to feel like you've rested. And let me tell you something, traveling is not rest. It's not, it's traveling. That's what it is. 
and it's terrible. Oh, I just want to fly. Over. It's horrible. It's so romantic. Okay, I'm going to put you in a metal tube and shake it the whole way. Gosh. And let's be honest, every time you land, it's a miracle. It's a miracle every time. Gosh. Okay. I must learn how to rest. Parents, children under five, raise your hands right now. You're in hell, it's okay, you're gonna survive. <laughs> Do you know why your, your baby and your toddler doesn't know how to sleep? Because they don't know how to sleep. It's your job to teach them. It's your job. Where well, my two-year-old just won't sleep. They're two. They won't do anything. They are terrorists. And their sole goal is to kill themselves and everyone in the family. I, I, I'm not making this up. We have the missionary center house. The dad comes home and he says, look at my daughter. She wanted a bag from the grocery store. Ha, 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 ha. What do you think the four-year-old did with the bag? I was like, give me that! <laughs> they have one goal every day and to die, and your job is to thwart that. <laughs> you gotta learn how to rest. Listen to me, parents, you gotta teach your toddler how to rest. You gotta teach him. My son hated naps. I don't wanna, I don't need a nap. I don't, I don't. You know what we did? We tied his door shut. <laughs> and some of you are like, oh, man, I just, I just gotta go to another church. We would tie the door, we would tie the door shut. I would have to pin a chair up against it, tie the door. I know it's not fire safe, we didn't leave the house. And you know what he would do on the other side of the door? It was like the devil himself was on the other side of the door. My wife would be like, oh my gosh, we're being so cruel. And I'm like, behind me, Jezebel, get behind me. And then, right, after time, what happens? You can only scream like that for so long. And then what happens? You just <laughs> We would open the door and he would be sleeping right, like, like right up against the door. Every day for weeks and then one day it was more like Bleh. and then it was Bleh. and then it was Bleh. and then it was okay, I'm defeated. <laughs> I gotta learn how to rest. Real Sabbath rest, real Sabbath rest, real rest. Write this down. It's called stopping. Listen to me. You will never start living for God until you can start stopping for God. Some of you have no, I just want to offer my life to the Lord. Even Elijah got burned out. He brought fire down from heaven to Lord kill me in one day, one day. Jesus says this, so don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. Listen to me, the church has been fighting over what day to worship since Jesus left. Stop fighting over the day and just stop. Stop. You gotta stop. Let me teach you how to stop. Stop for a few moments every day. It's called a quiet time. Every day, every day I stop and read God's word, every day. Some of you listen to the debrief, you're just like, I just don't, I just am so amazed at all you know because I've been stopping and reading every day for 20 years. You try it, try it. This is why there's all these idiots who claim to be followers of Christ. Oh, I just love Jesus, but I'm gonna do whatever I want. You know why that is? Because they never stop, they never read, and they don't know. They don't know. Stop, stop it. Right? See, here's what the problem is. In life, you know what we do? We just keep adding. Like, like there's more hours. Oh, I'm single and I get married. I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm, stop it. Oh, we got married and we love each other and we had a kid. Stop it. Stop. When you have a kid, you are no longer going to sleep for at least a few weeks. I used to tell people, you could break into my house with a car in the middle of the night and I would not know. Because when our kids were little, bodies fell, people cried, things shattered. That was just the evening. 
My son, my son would get up in the middle of the night every night and run for his sister's bedroom because I told him, don't come in mine. <laughs> and our house curved and you could hear him because he could never make the turn in the night. So you're, ah! I'm like, he's fine, he's fine. The hospital is open in the morning. <laughs> Next, it's regularly scheduled. Well, I went to church twice this year. Oh, good for you. Elijah missed a nap and wanted to die in one day. So many of you guys, you, just, you, you feel so good, and I'm glad you're here. And here's the thing that breaks my heart. Most of the people in our church who need to hear this, you know where they're not right now? Here. They're on the boat, why am I so tired? They're on a the plane, why am I so tired? There's someone, why am I so, because you're not stopping. It amazes me, all the Christians that I meet that love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength but haven't been to church in a month. Stop. Stop regularly. Stop. And here's how you need to stop. You need to learn to stop daily in a quiet time with God. You need to learn to stop weekly where you connect with other Christians who actually share the same values and have the same calling you do. It's called small group. And you need to stop weekly and gather together for worship. You think God's in heaven starving for worship? Or do you think he knows what we need? And you know why it is? Isn't it amazing? Human beings, we all worship something. Most of us just worship the wrong thing. Next, you gotta learn to block out work and the world. You gotta block it out. That's why you stop from everything. That's why your servants don't work. That's why the donkey doesn't work. That's why your iPhone shouldn't work. Turn it off so you can turn on to God. Turn it off. You gotta stop it. You know what, this is, this is the greatest cultural lie, a work vacation. Whose idea was that? Stupid. If you're working, you're not vacationing. You're not resting. Block it out. I love this story. Anybody ever had a week like this? The fishermen are following Jesus. They go out into the lake. There's a fierce storm. Anybody had a fierce storm? Some of you teachers went back to work this week. There's some students. You're like, that's a fierce storm. That is a, that is a nine-month hurricane right there. All right. But a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill it with water. You know what that means? They're all gonna die. They're all gonna drown. But gee, where's Jesus? He's sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Why does he have a pillow? Because he's smart. <laughs> he's God, he's not dumb. The disciples woke him up. We're dying. And you don't even care. Everybody thinks they're dying. Jesus is rimming. He's R-E-M. He's just like, <sighs> How do you do that? He blocked the world out. He blocked work out. He decided to rest. Can you imagine? Don't you wish you could sleep like that? You know why little kids crash? Because they know how to block the world out. Let me tell you something. You know why you can't sleep at night? It's not because you're thinking about God. You're thinking about your life. You're thinking about your work. You're thinking about all the things that need to get done. And here's why you need to learn the principle of stopping. Because you're not God and the world doesn't need you to exist. Your work, your problems, your struggles, they'll all be there the next day. But if you don't learn to stop and you don't learn to rest, you might not be. People who sleep less than seven hours a night, medically speaking, are guaranteed to have a heart attack before 50. Do you know what happens to you at night when you sleep? Your brain washes itself. Isn't that crazy? There's a car wash inside. <laughs> Your brain decides what memories do we need to keep and what memories do we need to let go. And then your body runs a whole system check. What do we need to fix? It's maintenance. Isn't that crazy? God wants you to stop so your body can do maintenance. And you wonder why your back hurts, your every, everything hurts. Next, resting is God-focused. You've got to make it about God. Psalms 4.8 says this, 
In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. Man, pray with your kids before they go to bed. Isn't it crazy the things we tell kids? Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. If you should die before you wake, I pray the Lord your soul to take. There's no monsters under the bed either, Johnny. Good night. What is that? What is that? In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. You need God the more stressed you are. And you know what's so sad? When you're stressed out, you know the first thing you cut out? God, small group, Bible study, quiet time. Man, that's like being in the hospital and cutting your IV because you're really sick. I can't carry this thing around. <laughs> Next, real rest is relaxing and refreshing. Relaxing and refreshing. Listen to me, especially those of you who are under 30. When I was under 30, I had a hard time resting. I didn't know how. It's a discipline. It must be learned. 47, we went on vacation. My wife made fun of me. She took pictures, posted on Instagram. I was on a floaty out in the lake, asleep. I didn't even care if I died. I was ready to go, ready to go. She said, what were you doing out there? Nothing. I just floated away from you and your sister and the kids. I was gone. Right? It's relaxing and refreshing. You know what breaks my heart when I see you guys and you come back from vacation and you look worse than when you left? I've been back for two weeks. You know what everybody keeps telling me? You look good. You look good. You look really good. Do you know why that is? I'm rested. I'm really rested. I laid on a floaty. No iPhone, no earbuds, just me and the lake and no one. You know, it's beautiful. You gotta learn to do that. Thank you, one person gets it. Yeah. All right, last point. Only Jesus can provide real rest. You know what your marriage needs? More of Jesus. You know what your work needs? More of Jesus. Single people, you don't need a spouse, you need more of Jesus. That's what you need. We all need more of Jesus. And the problem is we're all running to something. Every single one of us is running to something. And here's the thing that breaks my heart. Every time we run from something but God, we are not rested. Some of you are running to alcohol. Some of you are running to Vegas. Some of you are running to drugs. Some of you are running to sex. Some of you are running to porn. Some of you are running to work. Some of you just run to fantasy and you run over and over and over again and you're more and more exhausted and Jesus says, how'd that drink work out? Why do you think it is that our whole culture wants to be stoned? I read this on Instagram, this is real. It was a post and it said this, mommy needs a joint, should be just as accepted socially as mommy needs a glass of wine. Listen to me moms, your kids don't need you stoned or drunk. Your kids need you full of the love of Jesus that he has for you and the love that he has for them. That's what your kids need. And there's a reason our culture needs to be stoned. Our culture needs to be stoned because they've forgotten their need for Jesus. And this is what Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary, all of you who carry heavy burdens, and I will give you 
rest. Take my yoke upon you. Jesus says, come work for me. Come work with me. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Do you know what I believe most of our anxiety is? I believe most of our anxiety is our soul screaming for rest. Screaming for God. Screaming to stop it. Our whole culture is screaming. And Jesus says, I'm here. I'm here. But you have to turn to him and not something else. You don't need a glass of wine. You need Jesus. You don't need a joint. You need Jesus. You don't need a new job. You need Jesus. You need real rest, lasting rest. That's what every single one of us need. Christian or not, we all need more of God in our lives. And the reason our lives are out of control is because we've taken them out of the control of God. And God says, I command you, six days you shall work and one day you'll rest and you'll come and worship me. And I will give you rest for your soul. For your soul. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, right now, we cry out to you, the one true God, the God of heaven. For those of us who are Christians, we have not worshiped you, we have worshiped Pharaoh. We have turned our backs on the one true God and we have worked harder and longer to provide a bunch of crap for our kids and our lives. We've, we've, we've filled our lives with stuff, with the wealth of Egypt. God, help us to come back. Right now, God, we repent as a church. We say, we're sorry. And we lay down all these bags we don't need. All this stuff. We lay it down. We drop it. We empty our hands and we come to you, the Savior of our souls. We come to you, Jesus, and we ask for your forgiveness because we call you Lord, but we do what we want. We call you God and we have not stopped. We have not worshiped. We have not rested. And God, we're exhausted. And so we come to you weary, broken, and carrying way too many burdens. Jesus, we come. We pray this in your name and we love you. And we are so grateful for your forgiveness, for your grace, and for your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.